Thank you so much. Uh, welcome, and what a great panel we have and discussion. The title of our panel discussion is The Dirt on What We Eat. Pretty provocative title. There's a lot of things that we can address related to that title, and we're looking forward to that. We've got three individuals who can speak from firsthand experience about agriculture production, producing food, producing what you as an industry count on for your work. Uh, I'll go through the uh, panelists real quick, introduce them, and then we'll begin our discussion right away. A couple of housekeeping items. We do have a drawing for this group at the conclusion of our panel discussion today. You will need to be present to win, and good luck with that. And we're all going to leave uh, plenty of time for questions. We want you to be able to ask the question that maybe you came here today to uh, ask one of these individuals about food production that's important to you. And we'll leave plenty of time for that. If you have a question to ask, I'll ask that you wait for the microphone to reach you so we can all hear your question. Uh, we're being recorded, and I welcome the Facebook Live viewers that are with us right now. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope you enjoy the discussion as well. So with that, we'll begin with the introductions of our three panelists, and then we'll begin some of the topics at hand. To my immediate left is Russell Baining of Poth. Uh, he is a 1981 graduate of Texas A&M University with a degree in agricultural economics. He grows feed grains, cotton, watermelons, and wheat, as well as operates a 450 cow dairy with his brother and father in a beef cattle operation. Uh, he is the president of the Texas Farm Bureau, was chosen to that position in 2014. Next to Russell is Dr. Jason Clear. He's an associate professor and Texas AgriLife Extension beef cattle specialist. He's stationed at Texas A&M University in College Station where he develops and implements extension education programs to increase production efficiency and profitability of Texas beef cattle producers. He received his bachelor's degree in agricultural science from A&M in 1997, has a master's in animal science with an emphasis in beef cattle production in 1998 from Texas A&M, and a doctorate in animal science with an emphasis in beef cattle genetics and management from Texas Tech University. Thank you. Next to Jason, is David Volleman. David actually was born in Luxembourg and immigrated to the United States in 1993. He received his bachelor's degree in agricultural business from Texas A&M in 2012. David, along with his wife Anna, are partners in Volleman's Family Farm. The family farms around 4,000 acres, milks 5,000 cows, and bottles milk in returnable glass bottles. David has been managing the milking operation since 2013. In 2020, the farm started bottling its milk into returnable glass bottles where David also helps in sales and marketing. Please help welcome our three panelists today. <clears throat> Russell, you're a family farm, fourth generation agriculture producer there in Wilson County. Uh, what is it that you would want individuals uh, here in this industry to know about what you do and how you're connected to food? Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Gary. And I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and visit with you folks. Uh, we are a family operation, uh, as Gary mentioned. Uh, my brother, my brother and I, his wife, my wife, and uh, my parents are still fairly active. My dad more active than my mom. Uh, but we've been there a long time. Uh, our operation, actually what we're, where we're at right now, uh, my uncle and dad started in the early to mid-50s. Uh, started milking cows and we've expanded from, just from the dairy into beef, uh, into uh, uh, conventional crops like corn, grain, sorghum, cotton. Uh, Fifteen years ago or so, we started growing watermelons uh, and uh, we, still, we still grow some watermelons. It's the only vegetable or, or, or fruit that we do grow. <clears throat> but um, from our perspective, we're, we're conventional, uh, what you would refer to as a conventional opera operation, uh, meaning we don't do anything organic, uh, we don't do anything that's quote natural, uh, you know, but we, I think what I would like folks to know about the food we produce, uh, we take it very seriously. Uh, even though we're conventional, we use antibiotics in our beef and dairy operation. Uh, we follow label directions, we, we do it you know, we do it in a safe manner. Uh, I think just kind of comparing different types of uh, product, uh, methods of production, uh, 
there's, that's what they are. They're different methods of production. And uh, they all have a place in this world. Uh, they all provide a, a, a food supply for this country and many other places. Uh, so that's kind of our history. Uh, and uh, we're, we are, we're still doing it. And, and uh, we're, we're pretty diversified, as you can tell. Uh, kind of the same we use. We're not really, really good at one thing, so we have to do a lot of different things. But uh, <laughs> anyway, that's kind of our story. Jason, what would you want to share with a food buyer, a food preparer, about what you do or the industry that you assist? Uh, how are you connected to food? Yeah, thank you, Gary. And uh, uh, as Gary mentioned, I work for uh, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension and Texas A&M University in the Department of Animal Science. And so that's my primary job. And, and I get the opportunity to work with ranchers throughout the state of Texas and providing support for them, uh, helping them through continuing education. Some people think in agriculture it's just about sows, plows, and cows. But, but there is education that goes along with it, and we're continuously working with ranchers to improve, the one, the sustainability of the product that we produce, beef, also the, continue to improve the quality, but then also continue to emphasize food safety as well. And so that's what I spend my time doing, and we actually have, coming up here in, in three weeks, we'll have uh, around 2,000 ranchers from across the state on the campus of Texas A&M for continuing education. So that's one side of my job. Uh, but then I also, my wife of 23 years, and we have two boys, one's uh, come, fixing to be 17 and the other one 12. Uh, we have a small cow-calf operation in Madisonville, Texas, and uh, we raise purebred shorthorn cattle as well as Brangus cattle. Uh, you know, the key thing is that when the cattle that we produce or as I'm working with ranchers, uh, anything that we do, I want to make sure that the product that we produce in the beef cattle industry is safe enough that I'm going to feed it to myself, my wife, and more importantly, my two sons. And that's what I'm proud about the food supply that we produce here in Texas and across the U.S., that it is extremely safe, extremely wholesome, uh, and again, we think about it, we're going to feed it to our own families, and I think these guys will probably say the same thing. David, you have a, a wonderful personal story as well as a business story with Bolleman Family Dairy. How are you connected to food, and what would you like this audience to know about what you do and how you do it? Yeah, so just a little bit of a, a background. Uh, we moved here in 93. My parents started a dairy farm, and it was a small farm, uh, about 50 cows at the time. They did everything themselves, and we've slowly grown to the size we are now. And I have three brothers, so I'm just a little part of the family story that's sitting up here today. Um, most of them are still at home working right now. <laughs> so the, uh, the rest of the brothers, really, we, we encompass the whole thing, and we all wanted to come back, so we had to grow the farm to that size to, uh, to make room for everyone. And my older brother does our farming, so we grow uh, crops such as corn and grasses and such. Just about everything we grow is feed for the cows. And then uh, I, I manage the dairy farm where the cows are at, and then my next youngest brother, Andrew, has started our bottling business about a, uh, about a year ago. So we bottle our, our milk and plan on expanding that into other dairy products, um, plan on having the full dairy sector, uh, and just get connecting to the consumer. So we process our milk there. And then I have the youngest brother, Daniel, who also helps with that, as well as uh, our uncle's farm and such. So, um, so we, we really encompass kind of a, the whole supply chain from the, the grass that the cows eat all the way to the milk that gets to the consumer's hand. And we've just wanted to um, bring that story to the consumer. A lot of questions and people asking, where does this come from? Where is my food? And, uh, um, and how, how does it get there? And we, we do the whole story. So we, again, farm, cows, bottle that milk all the way to, uh, to the consumer. All right, now it's audience participation time with a show of hands. How many of you are right now engaged in production agriculture, have production agriculture experience? How about your parents? Were your parents in production agriculture? Grandparents? Great grandparents. Very representative of what we're finding out as a nation, as a whole, one and a half percent of Americans produce food, fiber, and fuel right now. Most Americans are at least three generations removed from production agriculture. So it's an area that we think not only is vital from a national security standpoint, 
but from an economic standpoint, it is one of the key engines that runs not only Texas, but runs this nation. Agriculture is critical to our country's success, but so many of the public are now removed and without that firsthand experience. So the conversations we're having today and the opportunity to talk about issues of common interest is so important. And we have a booth uh, just next door to us, uh, an agriculture pavilion that allows you to carry on those conversations and learn more about agriculture than just this one panel discussion. I encourage you to stop by and take a look and visit with those that are there. We heard the word sustainable. Did you hear uh, Jason talk about sustainable? It's a topic right now that is of great interest to the public, to you as food preparers, food buyers, restaurant owners, and it's important to agriculture as well, but it is sometimes a difficult definition to articulate because everyone has their own perspectives as to what it means. Both from our standpoint, uh, Russell, I'll begin with you. What does sustainable mean to you? Well, Gary, you know, you, you, everybody does have a, a different definition. Um, but uh, number one, from a producer standpoint, we have to be economically sustainable. That, that is the bottom line. Now, that being said, I always tell the story, we're farming some of the, since we use the word, I don't know, we're farming some of the same dirt that my grandfather started farming in 1930. And, uh, but we normally use the word soil or land. <laughs> but but uh, uh, So we're farming some of the same ground that he started farming 90 plus years ago. And that 250 acres, about what, what he had, uh, has been raising a crop for those 90 years. Other than you throw in a drought every now and then and, and, and it didn't raise a crop. To me, that's sustainable. We, we, we care for the soil and, and because you know, Jason mentioned it a minute ago about having a safe food supply, being able to, basically your own family is going to eat that food as well. Well, the same way with the land and, and, and the way we look at it, my grandfather always said, you, you must leave it better than you found it. And, and I think as ag producers, we, we understand that good soil, clean water, clean air, makes it possible for us to be economically sustainable. So that's the way we look at it. I'm, maybe I'm oversimplifying it, uh, but uh, you know, there's all kinds of ways. I mentioned we use synthetic fertilizers, but we don't just haphazardly do it. We take soil samples. It's what's needed. It's what we use. So that's what it means to me. Jason, your thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, what Russell mentioned, you know, the key thing is we, we have to think about a sustainability is the economic side. Uh, but I'll just have to say in, in the ranching world, uh, sustainable is kind of, a, you know, that's, that's old school to us because uh, we depend, as, as ranchers, uh, we, we, de we depend on the soils. And Russell and I had this discussion earlier that uh, we had a professor at A&M that uh, if we used dirt in class, he called it a four-letter word, okay, not so nice. But uh, we depend on the soil. We depend on the environmental conditions. And, and for us to be sustainable year after year or generation after generation, we've got to take care of those natural resources. In the cattle business at the cow-calf level, uh, the reality is about 80 percentage of the tonnage of beef in the U.S. is produced from grass, okay? And, uh, and then we finish those cattle out, the latter portion of their life, on grain. But 80 percent of our tonnage comes from grass. And uh, so to grow grass, we have to take care of the soil. And the soil is critical, as Brussels said. And sustaining those environmental conditions, making sure we're not mining all of the resources out of there so that it's not available for the next year or the next generation. And so when we think about sustainability, we look at a systems approach. And one of the things that's important from a ranching cattle business standpoint is land stewardship and taking care of that land so that it's available for the next generation to be able to produce it. And so uh, sustainability is, is a very important term. And uh, it's really, you know, hip right now, but for us in agriculture, it's been around for a long time, so. David, how would you define sustainability? 
Yeah, so just echoing what they say, it just comes natural for us being family farms that we want to pass down to the next generations and to, to my kids, for example. It's just, it comes natural for us. So I'll just give some examples of things that we do. Um, for example, when we use water, we use water to cool the milk and then cool the cows and then use that same water again to irrigate our crops. So, so water gets reused multiple times. That's one example. Another example would be in our returnable glass bottle. I mean, our whole milk business is based on that sustainable notion of we sell, the, we sell our milk and we pay a bottle deposit. The consumer pays a bottle deposit on that milk. And then when they return that bottle, they did get their deposit back. We take those bottles back, we wash, we rinse, and we refill the same bottles. So we're not just generating a lot of plastic waste. So our, really our whole model is based on, on that sustainability. And then like if, if there's milk that doesn't sell the first week, then we take that milk and we'll feed it back to our calves on the farm so that milk doesn't go to waste either. So I, I can just keep giving many sustainable examples, but it's like he said, it's economical. It just comes natural for us as farmers. We want our land, our resources to be there for the next generation. We heard the word family as they describe their own personal businesses, family, farms, and ranches. That's not the exception. There is a misconception in the American public that agriculture has become corporate that the family farm no longer exists. 95% of agriculture producers in this country are in family farm structures. They may have incorporated for tax or for liability reasons, but the structure, the operation itself is still family oriented and family centered. So please know that American agriculture still has the family at its foundation, but there are concerns, there are pressures. There are things that family farms and ranchers continue to try to overcome, some in their control, some out of their control. Russell, on your family farm, there are certain challenges that I know you and, and others in your position are, are trying to overcome. What are some of those challenges right now? Well, Gary, you know, um, and, and you know, depending on what you produce and where you produce it, uh, I, I think family farms face different challenges, obstacles, whatever you might want to call them. Um, labor is one, uh, you know, especially if you're in a labor-intensive uh, uh, industry. I mean, David can speak to that as, as well, and the dairy industry is pretty labor-intensive. Of course, you know, any type of fruit, vegetables usually. So l labor would be one. Um, the regulatory environment, you know, it has its ebbs and flows. Uh, uh, you know, we, we, we understand, we've already talked several minutes about about what we do and, and how we, we take care of the resources that we have. And, and, and David did a great job of mentioning that as well. Um, sometimes some of the, the regulations seem a little burdensome, uh, uh, especially when it's things that you're already doing and you've been doing them. But it's, sometimes it's just a matter of, um, of uh, itemizing it and all of that. And, and, but that takes time. Somebody has to do that. Uh, and not saying that doing those things is, is a bad thing because it goes back to what's good for, for your operation economically. Um, and I, I think I want to mention one for agriculture as a whole, and, and you mentioned a little bit about the misconceptions of, uh, uh, of what the public thinks about you know, agriculture going more corporate or, or there's corporate farms or there's factory farms. Uh, you know, there's folks that probably, you know, would think of the bottom and dairy milking 5,000 cows is a factory farm. No, it's, it's a farm. It's a dairy farm. You know, we milk about 500, you know, so that's, but, but they care for their cows the same way we care for our 500 or the same way the guy cares for 200. So I, I think one of the biggest obstacles I've seen in my lifetime is just the misconception you know, talk, talk to a farmer, talk to a rancher. Absolutely. If you have the opportunity, a lot of them will let you visit, you know, uh, visit with them, visit their operations. I mean, uh, I think that's something that goes back to, again, how many generations removed are we from, from the farm, you know? And, uh, uh, you know, I think we grew, I mean, we grew somewhat as well because more family members come in and yeah, you look like you're a huge, uh, a huge operation, but then you look at how many families are in ownership and then how many families that you have working with you, 
you know, as employees and that you're supporting. So I think that's some of the obstacles that I see. Challenges. Yeah. We'll call them challenges. You have a lot of pride in what you've accomplished and what the future holds for the Banning family farm operation. What, do, what are you most proud of? What really makes you stand up and be proud of what you're doing right now? Well, I'll just use the fact that we've sustained it for this many years. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I've always said, and, and, and uh, it's, no, it's having business partners is, is a challenge. And uh, uh, anybody that's had a family operation, uh, and I, I don't imagine that's just in agriculture. I mean, that can be in a restaurant, that can be in, uh, you know, the, the fact that we've, we've sustained it and uh, I think we've, we've grown uh, and I think we're, we've, we've left it in a better, better place and, and we're leaving it in a better place. And uh, I think that's what we're most proud of. Jason, the consuming public has evolving preferences. Uh, you track those, you study those, you advise beef cattle ranchers on what those preferences are. What have you noticed in recent years, changes in consumer preferences in, in regard to beef cattle? Yeah, I think as you look back over the last, you know, 10 to, to 20 years, Gary, um, and, and we've seen this in, in all of agriculture production, and you in the restaurant retail business, uh, food safety continues to be number one. And uh, you guys uh, on the prepared side, y'all know that that's kind of your thing that keeps you up at night. And uh, I will tell you that continues to be our concerned on the production side because we know that there are things that that can happen that can influence the food safety because even though we're ranchers okay we're cattle producers uh, ultimately we're in the food supply business and so it's important for us to to continue to focus on and make sure that the things we're doing at the ranch level whether it's right when that calf's born uh, you know, all the way into right before it's harvested, that we make sure that those things that we're doing, that at the end of the day, we're producing a safe and wholesome product. So that's, that's number one. And that's over the last 15 to 20 years, you've seen it on the retail side. Food safety is just paramount to the consumers today. And, uh, and I think in, in the beef industry and agriculture today, we're very proud of that. The, uh, the safety factor that we have and, and how much emphasis goes into that on the production side to make sure that you have a safe product to sell to your consumers. The other thing we've continued to see is uh, the trend of more branded products over the last 40 years. Uh, you know, instead of just commodity beef, uh, now we've got Nolan Ryan, we have Certified Angus Beef, we have 44 Farms, Certified Hereford, I mean, it's th those more of branded programs with the focus on quality. We all know that beef is a high value product. People are willing to pay 20, 30, 40, 50 dollars for a steak, but it better be quality. And when I mean quality, it better be tender, it better be flavorful, okay? And so one of the things that we've seen in the last 15 years, uh, just for example, of the, the, the amount of cattle 15 years ago, choice and better, choice and prime, was about 60%. Now we're over 80% of that. And you say, well, how is that happening? Uh, well, we've changed the way we feed cattle a little bit, but we focus more on the genetics. You know, And when I mean genetics, selecting for cattle that provide more marbling. And that's a way for us to do that and produce the better product. So I think continuing the focus on food safety, but then also improving the quality and consistency of our beef product. Because 20 years ago, we had some challenges with consistency and we continue to make strides with that. There are some terms associated with beef that you may be familiar with. Organic, natural, grass-fed, conventional. There's some confusion often in what those terms mean and, and what they actually represent. Jason, have you seen that confusion as well? Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, as you look at the different markets out there for beef, and there is the organic market. Well, Russell mentioned the conventional market as well as David here. Uh, you know, from a conventional market, uh, we mean that we, we will utilize fertilizer, uh, if an animal is treated, now our management strategies are to not have to, to have to treat an animal, okay, with, for sickness. Because uh, when we treat an animal for sickness, 
it costs us money to do that, plus we lose production, okay? And, uh, but we follow the labels on those products, we follow the science behind all of this to make sure at the end of the day that that conventional product from a food safety, wholesomeness, quality side is one that's just as safe as the organic, natural, whatever you want to call it, okay? Uh, and, and so that's the important thing. Now, are there consumers today out there in the market that prefer the organic product? Sure there are, okay? If they feel like that that product is better, then let's produce that, but let's not badmouth the conventional product, which we know is just as safe as that. But if they want to, if they want to consume organic product only, we'll produce it for it. We work with a lot of ranchers uh, and farmers with, that produce organic products. Uh, natural, natural really just has to do about minimally, minimally processed, okay? That's after the fact on the production side. Uh, our conventional product, when it leaves the farm or ranch, it's natural, okay? It's all natural. Uh, then the last one is the grass fed or grass finish. Uh, the reality is the beef, to beef industry today, uh, it is a grass fed based system, okay? As I mentioned earlier, uh, 65, 70 percent of an animal's life, of a calf's life, before it's put on feed for about 150 days, uh, is going to be on grass. So from day one when it's born until weaning at seven months, until we put it back on grass for some economic gains for another five months, until we put it into the feed yard where we finish it out on a grain-based diet to produce that, that grain finished taste. Uh, so as you can see, we're a grass-based system. Some people say, well, I don't know if I believe that. Well, 2011, who remembers where you were in, in uh, 2011? Okay, I know these two guys do. That was the great drought, wasn't it? And if you were in the restaurant business, what happened two years later to beef prices? They skyrocketed. Why did they skyrocket? Well, the reason was because we lost our forage production in the state of Texas, we had to contract. We lost over 20% of our cattle. We had to move them from the ranches. And, and so it was a challenge for us. So that's just a testament to the grass-fed grass approach. Now, are there markets for grass-finished product? Okay, is there anybody in here marketing grass-finished beef? Okay, there's a handful of people out there that prefer grass-finished. And that's another market that, as long as the consumers want that product, us in the production side, we'll produce it for them. So, You mentioned the grades. Uh, is there any movement at USDA or federal level to change the grading system for beef? Not at this time. As far as the grading system, uh, I think what we just continue to see is less and less on the select side, more and more on the quality as far as the uh, choice and prime side. And I think that's important because it, th we know that the more marbling we have in those products, we get into that choice grade, we're going to be able to provide a consistent product, more consistent product. And I think from a, a retailer or restaurant business, you know, that's your biggest headache when somebody says, hey, my steak's not good, you know. And if that's the first time that that consumer went to your restaurant, now we have this little thing called Facebook and social media, so now they blast it out as well uh, with that. And so consistency is one thing that we in the beef industry, we're continue to promoting that. And the rancher side, we want to produce that better product and more consistent product. And I, I think we have. David, I know quality is one of the benchmarks of your family's operation, what you promote, what you market it. How do you maintain quality from field to bottle at your farm? Yeah, so again, I guess I'll be the person with examples here. Um, we, being that we produce through quite a, quite a bit of the supply chain, we're always measuring quality. So on the feed side for cows, and this may apply a little less to y'all, but we're always checking nutrients of, of that feed. So when we harvest grass, we're checking what actually is the protein of that. Uh, when we harvest a corn plant as corn silage, we're testing what the nutrient uh, content of that is, what's the energy of that, what's the starch content. And then on when we, when we milk the cow, when we bottle that and we put that milk in our tanks, 
we're always monitoring those tanks and seeing what those uh, analysis are of quality when we refer to such things as bacteria and such. But as well, on the protein, every, every load of milk that, we, that comes off our farm, we're checking the protein of that, the butter fat of that. We're just really monitoring those cows and seeing how our whole system's working. And then when we bottle our milk, we'll bottle our milk and we'll hold it for a day just to double check and to check all that quality to make sure it is absolutely the highest before it ever leaves even our bottling facility and uh, goes on to the store. And then we're monitoring temperatures at, at, at grocers and such. I think another thing that goes even further into the quality, what really matters to the consumer is they, again, they want to kind of know where their food comes from and they want that story. And when we talk about all these marketing labels of grass fed and organic and all of this and, and how is yours better than somebody else's, I, I truly feel, and, and obviously that's where we've, we've put our, our money at and where we've worked on is, is if we can tell that story and we can connect that consumer, say the dairy products at our restaurant or so come from this farm and you can go tour that farm. We offer tours at Volumen Family Farm of our dairies and such. That really gives that consumer an emotional connection and says, yeah, I want to support these people because they're supporting this other family farm. And that's really what we're trying to do. And I feel like that brings uh, a lot of quality when the consumer themselves can come see where their food's coming from. I can go see it. They offer tours. And maybe I don't have time to go see it, but they offer tours so they must be transparent enough that, that we can trust them. And we can go see it whenever we do want to, uh, when we do have time. So I think that's a great way that we show our quality. We want this conversation to continue, and they're gonna, we're going to open it up for questions in just a little bit. And we hope you take advantage of that and ask questions that you might have. How many of you enjoy a flavored milk? Chocolate milk? <laughs> Strawberry? Oh, yeah, I see a few hands out there. David, you have found that flavored milk is one of the a big draws that you have. Yeah, so... We have a, we're unique, again, smaller bottler, and one of the ways that we differentiate ourselves is we make flavored milks. And that kind of keeps us a fun brand as well. Um, again, whole milk, 2%, chocolate, those are all staples. But we also offer strawberry, we offer vanilla milk, we uh, just launched a cappuccino flavored milk, and then we have, uh, we offer eggnog around Christmas, and then we have a whole plan of seasonal flavors. So there'll be, a, there'll be a new launch, and if you'll follow us, you'll see a new launch of a fall flavor that's, that's coming out. I don't really want to spill the beans on it yet. But then uh, there'll be all fun flavors throughout the year that, we, that we'd like to, to offer. Some ideas throughout, maybe over the course of the next year, could be like a root beer flavored or a cotton candy flavored or just all kinds of, uh, of unique flavors in our milk. We wish we could bring samples today, but we were unable to do so. Maybe, maybe next time. Do we have any questions from our audience? I want to stop now and see if you have any questions. Uh, don't be, yeah, we have a question over here. I'll hand the microphone, wait for the microphone to reach you so we can all hear, and we'll start that process. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so what David was saying, I, I just have a question to that. Keeping it um, special to your family, your family farm, um, can you explain to us what your family's decision was to keep you from going mainstream and being part of the, um, if I can use their names and not not be um, penalized for it, like the Bordens be, being a part of the Borden family or those, how do you keep, or what was your family's decision to keep it specific to just your family and, and dairy? So, um, so the question being, yeah, why did we decide to make our own brand as opposed to just going with the brands that are out there today? So we feel like the industry's consolidated some, and we felt like we wanted to be unique. We think we've lost some of the uh, innovativeness and the fun, you know, coming up with new flavors, really bringing consumers back to milk. A lot of feedback we get when they try our milks um, is, wow, I haven't been drinking milk for a while, but I really love this milk. So we're bringing people back. Putting it in glass, it has a better flavor. It tastes better. We really keep other flavors out better. And then, um, and then we, again, we really wanted to connect with the consumer. And we've wanted this for years. We've always had this mindset of, look, we produce such a great product and we, we put so much care into our farm and everything. How do we communicate that with the consumers who, who live in town, who live in the cities, and it's very hard for them to connect. And so we've always wanted to make our own brand. And now that we've had the brothers kind of come back to the business, we've had the, the human capacity to be able to, let's take it to that next level. Let's bring it back to the consumers and, uh, and try to make that connection. And, uh, and I, I think it's good as a consumer in general, if you, if you look at brands, just trying to 
get as close to that farm as possible and, and kind of op break that supply chain up a little bit. We saw it a little bit with COVID, um, you know, when, when we're like, why is there a milk shortage or, or such? Or when we had a, the, the freeze and there was no milk in our grocery stores. Well, when things are going through very few bottling plants or very few plants, then one thing happens somewhere and we feel the effects pretty quick. Even though all these plants are top notch, it's just things happen and then we'll feel it. So we, I, I feel that it'd be great if we try to search out farms and try to shorten that supply chain and really connect. And when I think we do that, we get a safer, a safer food supply here in the US because we're not all relying through very few channels. Yeah, Gary, can I add a cup? We see the same thing on the, the beef cattle side. We're seeing more and more interest in uh, ranchers that, one, the operation's expanding from family, so we're, we need to add value or capture more value in the beef cattle that we are producing. And so they will feed their own cattle out and they will market it to the local side. And, and the reality is, as you well know, in the retail side of things, uh, consumers today uh, they have more time on their hands than they ever have. You know, as we've removed, gone from an agrarian society where you're having to produce your own food, you know, take care of your own things, uh, you know, your day-to-day -day life, you have more time on your hands. And so consumers today are more interested in where their food comes from. They're more interested in the whole food experience with that. And uh, for us in the ranching side, uh, and, and just in agriculture in general, we need to do a better job sharing those experiences with it. You know, the beauty of the American food supply is one and a half percent of the population feeds the rest of us, okay? And that's an amazing feat that we've done in the last hundred years, okay? The challenge with that is, if you'll notice from an agricultural standpoint, most agricultural producers, farmers, ranchers, are not gonna be like us three guys up here. They don't like to stand in front of a crowd. They don't like to toot their own horn. They're very conservative and reserved. And they just like to do their job and that's feeding people. But we've gotta do a better job of, do, of telling the story, opening up our operations to them. And we are doing that. Uh, one example, the Texas Farm Bureau is, is their they're telling the story, and I think that's something we have to continue to do. We got a beautiful story. I mean, you, you know, I'm on the small scale uh, academic side and, you know, a small family operation, but these two guys have got a multi generational family operations, and that's what 95% of agriculture is. So, you know, those are things that are important to us. Any other questions that you might have? Yes, ma'am. Have you found that humanizing your operation, being from a family farm versus being from a corporate operation, does it make a difference in the amount of consumers with your product? I didn't quite hear what you So staying small versus being big. Have you noticed that humanizing your operation, letting people see you as, as a dad, as a husband, as a business owner, does that make a difference for you like it does in other industries as far as a consumer's perception? You're asking... You're asking, does it make, do we does see a make, difference? Does it make a difference? Yes, does it, it matter more now that you're out there telling the story, showing the photos, letting people see that you're people like we are? Yeah. You're uh, well, not a machine. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think it does. I mean, I, I, I definitely think it does. I mean, because, uh, uh, like I said, we, we, you know, Jason said it earlier, and I think David said it as well. You know, we're, we're we, we do everything we can to produce a safe product. And... and you know, and, and uh, uh, so, yeah, I see, I see good input from visiting with folks, being able to do that and just having those conversations. I don't, that would be my answer. Yeah, definitely. I think we, we in agriculture, again, we don't like to, to toot our own horn, but we've got to make sure that consumers understand what we're doing and tell our own story versus rely on somebody on the Internet or something else to tell a story that they think is the story, okay, but it's really not. I mean, I, that's the thing is, you know, I get frustrated is that, you know, when I hear this factory farming scenario, the ranchers and the farmers that I deal with and that I am, we're people, you know, and we have emotions, and those emotions are one, we are feeding people, 
we're feeding our own families, but two, and we see this on the, on the animal side is, is we get criticized, we're not taking care of the animals. Well, in reality, if we don't take care of the animals, they don't take care of our families because if we don't take care of their needs, make sure that they're managed, make sure they get the nutrients, you know, a balanced diet, they don't produce for us and they don't help feed our families with that. So yes, I think, you know, putting the, the human side of it is crucial with that. David? Yeah, I, again, echoing them, uh, we, we get them, since we've started our own brand and we've have our social media channels, uh, Volman's Family Farm, we've, uh, we've got a lot of feedback and it's been great feedback. It really makes us feel good too because um, our, our operation hasn't changed. We, we still do our, our great farming practices, our great dairy practices. However, now we get great feedback from consumers and they tell us like, what, we really appreciate what you do. And then we, we do farm tours. I just did one uh, yesterday. Um, then the, the people are like, wow, like I could have never imagined this is great. I appreciate you showing it. Now we understand. We didn't have to change ourselves to follow uh, maybe a certain model, like we have to be an all-natural grass-fed, gluten-free, X, Y, Z. We just showed them what we did and the consumer understood. I think it's just a lack of communication there and that's again what our brand is trying to do is open that communication channel, make that connection between consumers and farmers and, and I think uh, it's amazing the feedback we've had. And there's actually some public opinion polls that address the very question that you raised. The American public by over 90% trusts the American farmer, the individual, the farmer and rancher that produces, they trust. But only 70% trust the practices of farming and ranching. They're suspicious, they're unaware, they're mm -hmm. concerned. So there's a gap. There's a gap between the individuals in agriculture and the public's perception of how they produce food, fi fiber, and fuel. So that's what this exhibit is about. That's what this conversa conversation is about, is to hopefully close that gap so the American public begins to trust the practices of agriculture as much as they do of the individuals in agriculture. And that's a recent phenomenon. That has not been the case until the recent 10 or so recent years. So it's something that has to be addressed. And agriculture is committed to that conversation because we want that trust to be the same. We want the trust between the individual and the practices to be at that high level. Great question, great question. Any other questions of the audience we can address real quick? Yes, ma'am, there's one in the back. After that point you just made, um, you after that point you just made, it made me, I own a restaurant in West Texas and I'm trying to do farm to table and all that, but my health department is not with me. They're telling me no, and you're gonna have to go to the health department to convince them that yes, you can do this because the health department doesn't trust the farmers. And they're telling me, no, you must buy it from here for us to approve this and everything. So just FYI, we're, we're, the restaurants are trying to do it, but we're getting stopped by health department inspectors. Yeah, and I, I think that comes down to, and I'll just kind of talk about on the beef side, uh, you know, any food product, beef that is sold, uh, has to be either state inspected or federally inspected. And, uh, you know, that's to make sure that uh, that product is, is a safe, wholesome uh, product for the consumer. It does provide some challenges on the farm to fork, and especially we saw that during the pandemic where we had a lot of ranchers that had cattle that could have been harvested, all right, and sold. People wanted to buy that product, but we were limited on the, the small mom-pop processing plants that could harvest that, but then also could have inspectors in them as well. Uh, there are some uh, grants that are coming out, and there seems to be a big interest in expanding some of that local processing, beef processing capacity to address some of the things that you're talking about right there. But it, it, it's a real concern that we've kind of, we've lost that infrastructure there, the local infrastructure to be able to connect the, the locals, you know, the, the consumer with the producer. But there is a lot of interest 
that's been generated over the last year and a half, and, and we're seeing some little plants that are starting to be built as well, which I think is great. Yeah, I, I would love to take away a lot of that regulatory burden that we have to do to make our stuff the food grade that it can be shipped to everybody, because it's, it's expensive and it's a lot of work. At the same time, we don't want to compromise safety. So I'm kind of torn between that all the time. How can we make it still very safe, following all the rules makes it safe, but as least burdensome, burdensome as possible. And we probably should have some discussions with our regulators and such to try to, to keep it realistic. I know we have another question. We'll get to you. Let me mention real quick, we are going to have a drawing here in about five or so minutes. If you don't have a red ticket, raise your hand, a red ticket when you came in, because there's one here on the front row uh, that needs a ticket. Make sure you get those, because uh, you have to be present to win. And we want everybody to have an opportunity uh, to do that. Also, I wanted to mention, we're going to be doing something fun in the Ag Pavilion here. We're going to be doing a corn eating contest. Who can eat a corn on the cob real fast? <laughs> yeah, we've got prizes and we want, uh, we want you to be able to participate in that. So look for that here shortly. After we finish our presentation here, we'll be doing a special corn eating contest over in the Ag Pavilion. Okay, we did have a question, I believe. Raise your hand. Yes, sir. This gentleman in the back. Uh, it's not really a question, it's more of a comment. I am with a service company here in town. People sitting in these chairs are, our, are my customers. And so you guys grow the food, they make the food, I eat the food. Uh, and <laughs> I'm pretty good that. at what I do, by Weird. God. Um, one and a half percent, that was an eye-opening statistic. Had no idea, probably never would have if I hadn't have strolled in here. But... Uh, to you guys, hats off. God bless you, and thank you for what you do. And keep up the good work. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the comments, but the, really the way we look at it, I know these guys, we're in this together. Absolutely. We're in this together. To, to the young lady's question a while ago, do we, do we feel like we're getting good, you know, getting response? We are, because we, we, do, we are in it together, whether... It's at the retail level, at the restaurant level, at the grocery store level, or service companies in between. Uh, it, it, it's important. And I think, you know, the pandemic's been mentioned in passing the last, during our conversations, Gary. And in a lot of ways, if we think about it, and, and the fact that this country is food self-sufficient, pretty important. I mean, you know, there's, and that's not, I'm not doing that just to toot the horn of the producer because it takes everyone, it starts at the producer, but it takes everyone to make sure that we are food self-sufficient. And uh, I, think, I think everybody would agree with that, and I think the pandemic really pointed that out. We had challenges. Uh, Jason mentioned them very well. It's on the beef industry and the dairy industry, and uh, we, we dairy just south of town, and we had, to, we had to dump several days' worth of milk for different reasons. The processor was closed, or what? You know, couldn't couldn't get there. Uh, had had power issues, uh, but and I know there was times you might have went to the grocery store, and couldn't get what you wanted. What, but there was always at least some food there, and uh, and we probably can do some things to improve that as well. Absolutely. And uh, uh, but anyway, just thanks for the comments. Yeah, uh, Norman Borlaug won the Nobel Peace Prize for developing wheat varieties that uh, save millions of lives uh, in underdeveloped countries because of the boost in production. He made a comment, uh, he spent his final years at Texas A&M working there, and he made a comment one time or a quote that uh, a country, it, it is imperative that a country feed itself, okay? And if you look around the world, Okay, and those countries that cannot feed themselves, uh, there's more wars, there's more unrest within the country, and so on. So food security is so important to this country, and we've got to make sure that we as a country support the farmers and ranchers, that one and a half percent, to make sure that whether it's regulations, policy, uh, additional research, ways to, to improve our production, we've got to make sure we do that so that all of us don't go hungry. 
because hungry people become crazy people, you know. And we saw that. You saw a little glimpse of that during the pandemic, you know, of people just kind of gorging and buying, pulse buying. So I think food security is something we, as a country, we need to continue to focus on and look at because it's imperative to the well-being of this country. Texas has some unique challenges when it comes to agriculture because of our success as a state. We are a high growth state, but 240,000 farmers and ranchers are in Texas right now, but we're losing acreage every day to development, particularly in the I-35 corridor and those areas of high growth. And there's a, an infrastructure concern that agriculture is talking about right now. What is that critical mass of acreage of working farmland? Nationally, a thousand acres a day of working farmland are lost to development. A thousand acres. In Texas, there are pressures in certain areas in which that's occurring, and agriculture's aware. And we're working with those that can influence some of those policy choices to make sure there's enough infrastructure for agriculture to be successful. But a high growth state means demand for land and demand for those suburban and outlying areas, and a lot of that is traditional farm and ranch land, as you can imagine. Another important note about agriculture, the average age of an American farmer and rancher right now is 59 years old. 59 years old. Where are we 20 years from now? Is it the David Volumans and that generation that's leading this industry and taking us to the next level? It's the universities in our state that are producing those graduates to take that next step and to lead the, age, the agriculture community going forward. But that's another demographic and another issue that agriculture is very aware of, trying to train, identify, learn uh, from young leaders who want to be in agriculture. But the truth is, we're all in agriculture. We're all in this together, and we're together as a group, I think, can still maintain the safest, most affordable, and most abundant food supply in the world. We are the envy of the modern world with modern agriculture. And I want you to have pride in that. And I want you to know that that's a part of what you support and are part of. With that, I'd like to commence with our drawing and give all of you a chance to win a prize today. We'll go forward and draw. Make sure you have your red ticket and we'll get that number and we'll see if we can get a winner. You do need to be present to win.